Hello, I'm Sean Paul with Morningstar Missions. Thank you so much for stopping by and watching our video series on how to become a full-time missionary. You know, our prayer is that these become a massive blessing to you and get you started right in the mission field. If you want to contact me, feel free to do so. My email address is in the description of this YouTube video. If you want to network with fellow missionaries, we also have a link there to our Facebook group, please join. We would love to have you. Make sure you subscribe to this channel because we're definitely going to be adding a lot more content in the future. And then the final note is that this video series is based off a book by the name of Pursuing the Call. The author is Daniel Amastra and he's a full-time missionary in El Salvador. Thank you so much for watching. Hey, Mike, thanks for joining uh, for this Zoom call class on how to become a missionary. And uh, obviously, for those that don't know you, you have you live in Honduras and you have a, uh, a Spanish Institute of Honduras. It's a it's a language school in Siwatapeque. And uh, before we kind of get started, I just want to make sure everybody knows that I have his link in description on this class. You can contact him because they have online classes for Spanish as well. So if you want to be a missionary in Ecuador, you could still take uh, Spanish classes uh, with them as well while you're in the United States or wherever you're at in the world. So uh, just make sure you check out that link. But today we're going to just talk about language and the importance of language. And I think you're going to find this a, a, a really great class. So uh, make sure you watch the whole entire thing because Mike's actually going to share something about homeschooling at the end. Hey, thanks for jumping on here, Mike. Sean, it is good to be back with you again. I think last time we were together, we talked about doing business and missions. And uh, I, was, I had such a great time with you on that. And so, yeah, so today we're going to talk about language. So just to kind of tie this into business as, you know, as missions, we are at the Spanish Language at the Spanish Institute of Honduras. We are a business. OK, um, but our primary business is very mission focused. Uh, <clears throat> I would say that in the last, we've been in business, language school has been here for 11 years and we've been owned it for nine years, um, eight and a half, nine years. Yeah. And I would say that in that time, we've had well over a thousand, pushing 2000 students come through, wow. whether it's through our online classes or our um, in-person classes. And I'm going to say that 98% of those students are all missionaries. Um, yeah, it's 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 really impressive uh, what the what the what the language um, institute has done here in Honduras, helping missionaries train for their work primarily here in Honduras, but not exclusively. Um, we we certainly see our part of the uh, global kingdom effort, um, preparing missionaries through language as a a real critical po uh, part of what we do. Here, uh, we really believe that um, that as we help the, um, the the incoming missionaries learn the language, that we are helping them prepare for the work that they're going to be doing. Oh, absolutely. another thing, yeah. And another thing that we do as part of that is we really um, we, we we give them a support group while they're here. Mm -hmm. One of the things that new missionaries. You know, they, they leave their, their, their home church and leave their community. They come down here and they're, they kind of jump into a new culture. They don't speak the language. They don't have a whole lot of friends. Um, most of the time their missions agencies are, you know, in the U.S. or whatever. And so what all of a sudden they find after like the excitement of the first few days is here, that now all of a sudden, you know, they're, they're, the reality of life in a new country hits them. And so one of the things that we do here at the, at the Institute is we really um, become a support group and um, uh, a family for them. As a matter of fact, our our uh, mantra is come as friends, lead as family. Yeah. Now, you guys, now, let me just kind of just share with people that is obviously just watching this. 
Uh, one thing that from what I understand, I mean, one, I'd like to make sure that people understand, you know, you're you're like the visionary. You're the guy. You're the guy with the big picture. And then you have some I don't know how many you have two sons or three sons. Well, I have three sons and we're, and we're adopting uh, a fourth one. He's only seven, but okay. I've got great plans for him. <laughs> and so you you have them involved in your businesses. So you have a son. Isn't his wife as well help run this? Uh, the language school. Yes. So, so Mark is my oldest son. He's 25 years old. He runs the language school and he actually married one of our teachers. Um, she's been with us since just about day one. And um, they fell in love, got married, and we just had our first grandbaby. That's awesome. Yeah. So so then the other thing, too, is that that what I understand, because I didn't follow the system. So what I understand, many missionaries will come to Honduras. They will hit you first. They will come to Siwatapeque, and then they actually stay there for a period of time. I'm not saying all of them, but it seems like a lot of them do. And when you say they come as friends, they leave as family, it's because they were like literally a part of your school in the sense that's what they were doing day in and day out, learning the language. Is that pretty much correct? Yeah. For the for those people that come to 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 spend like anywhere from three to nine months studying Spanish to become fluent in Spanish, um, they typically study between three and four hours a day, and then they have their homework and practice time afterwards. So that becomes their uh, that becomes their job for the time that they are here in language training. Okay. Now you know I uh, I'm going to kind of jump to my testimony here real quick because I think it's important to add it right here. Uh, and I've been a missionary for eight years. And don't crucify me for whomever's watching this. I've already shared this with Mike. I speak guerrilla Spanish. I mean, basically, I know how to. Uh, I know how to put gas in the car. I know how to go to KFC and order chicken, but that's pretty much it. Now, I am not, I'm not saying this to say, well, hey, Sean survived, so why should I have to learn? I'm going to tell you right now, I wish to God to this day that I could learn how to speak Spanish. It, you know, the thing that I can say is this is, is, you know, I'm just a weird guy. Okay. So I'm kind of, one of these guys that isolate in my ministry is kind of per permits me to do that. But trust me, I have a hindrance in the relationships I can build into the community. You know, it, it, it really, it can hinder me, but I've learned to staff the people properly on how to help me. So I just want to say this is that, you know, when I got here, the first thing I thought is I got to start doing something because my supporters want to see things going on. So I can't sit in a language school because they'll just see, think I'm just taking vacation. But Mike, that's a wrong attitude, is it not? Well, it, it, it is, Sean. And believe me, you're not the only one um, that we've seen that have done that has done this. But let me tell you, um, let me tell you something that we've noticed. We, we, like I said, we've been doing this for about nine years. We have a lot of observations about missionaries and language. If you don't come down here and hit language fields school first before you jump into ministry, it's highly unlikely that you will ever go to language school. Just as in your case, Sean, you get busy you get, and you just said, I can't. I only know one person that him and his wife, they stopped what they were doing for, um, they'd been missionaries for two years. They stopped what they were doing and they went back to language school because they, he's a pastor. Right. He's got a pastor's heart and he realized that he wasn't able to fully present the word of God. Yeah, OK. Amen. And so they stopped what they were doing, went back to language school. They were down in Columbia. And um, uh, but he's the only person that I know of that has ever been able to, to do that. And so my advice to anybody that's headed for the, for the field is make it a priority to put language first before you start anything. Once you start, you will get busy doing great things, but you will never, ever find time to go back to the yeah. language. The well, odds, think, are your, odds are not in your favor to do that. Yeah. Because I, I, and again, I think it's, this is really important. And I think it's a good exchange here because the thing, again, I've done well in staffing the people to do what I need to do, but I can promise, I can promise anybody that's watching this video, it has hindered everything that we have done because I have to have somebody to call this person, call that person, schedule this, schedule that. I mean, literally my whole entire life is just telling people what to do. 
that know uh, English to go and say that in Spanish. And it's a frustration. And, and also, too, it's very demoralizing. Um, I, I feel very demoralized many times that I don't know Spanish. Now, again, some people will say, well, why don't you learn Spanish? I mean, that's a whole different discussion. Um, and trust me, I'm actually thinking about that, meaning I have been to a language school here in Copan Rinas. Obviously, I don't live by Siwatepeque. I did very well, but it was more of the exchanging and trying to hear and understand what the people are saying. That's my that's my issue. But again, it's not excuse. But I'm just trying to say, please, for whomever's watched this video, please listen to what Mike says. Please hit language first because you think it's going to hinder your ministry because you got to take six to nine months learning language. I promise you, you will propel yourself way further, way faster in ministry because now you know the language. Well, Sean, I want to, I want you to know that I appreciate the fact that you are honest about what could be considered this this lack of, of, of Spanish on your part. I mean, I think that takes a, you know, I, I just appreciate the fact that you're open and honest about that. But I want to go back to something that you said, which was that people say, well, my supporters are, they're paying me to come down here and do something, do something, right? And that's why a lot of times people don't want to spend the amount of time needed in language school. One of the things that we try to do, because we've seen this over and over, we've had people, a number of people, a majority of people say, Mike, I can't spend nine months in language school my supporters right and i say listen you need to educate your supporters mm -hmm. because i'm and i always ask them this let's just say that you had a, an ache in your stomach and you went to the doctor and you said hey so where'd you graduate and he said oh no i couldn't i couldn't stay in i couldn't stay in in uh, medical school for eight years i, I quit at four i had to get out and start working i think i turned around and leave <laughs> that, that doctor's office right well, if you think of yourself as a professional, as a missionary, and I, you know, sometimes we 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 kind of put the the, the spiritual godly thing on it, but in in a sense, that is your profession, that's your calling. Absolutely. If, if you are not trained in every area that you need, if you don't know your Bible, and if you don't know language in order to present the Bible, because that's your job, right? Um, and, and, and I know missionaries have different um, things that they do, but the primary purpose of a missionary is to present the gospel in whatever way that comes about throughout the day. If you can't do that, then you are not fully trained. Mm -hmm. And that's what we see. We see people come in, they don't stay long enough because they feel this, the, the missions agency needs them on the field. That's the other thing. Sometimes we have students that want to stay, but their missions agencies are saying, we have got to have you down here. We just had somebody leave the children's home. We've got this spot that has to be filled. So they're also being pushed by their missions agency to get out there. So what we do, Sean, is we really try to help people in advance before they even arrive. We'll, we'll bring up the conversation. Have you talked with your supporters about the necessity of spending at least six months in language school? How does your mission agency feel about language? And it, we, we have had a, new, a number of talks with missions agencies that actually helped them um, to, to see the value in uh, letting their, uh, their, their mission, uh, missionaries stay a couple of extra months. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, one thing that, uh, you know, we're, we're talking about, uh, you know, learning the language and, you know, using language school as, a, as an example. And I can, t I, I can say this because I know a lot of people – well, we'll we'll say, well, you know, I'm going to get Rosetta Stone, or I'm going to get Duolingo, or or whatever. Uh, look, I'm raising my hand. I'm the I'm I'm the guy that's bought three different Spanish programs. I've gone through Rosetta Stone. I've probably gone to the second level of Rosetta Stone. Uh, I've I've done Duolingo. I've had the 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 subscription. I paid for you know, and again, I've worked hard in trying. But I can truly say this. And again, I'm not trying to just like, hey, I'm going to promote Mike's language school. But I'm just going to say this. When I was at the actual language school here locally, I learned way more than I did through the apps. I'm not saying that the apps don't work, but I'm just going to say that when you have a true instructor there helping you and, and working you through the process and they are the professionals in teaching language, it's it, to me, it's it's a. Uh, it's well worth the money spent to do that. Because like I said, 
the Duolingo and the, the Rosetta Stone, they just don't even explain why you're saying it. I mean, that's my frustration with those apps because I'm like, why am I saying this? I don't even understand why I'm saying this, you know, and it never made sense to me. So, again, I know people are probably watching, man, you've done all that. And you haven't learned language. Well, again, it's that's another discussion. But but again, I think having an actual instructor that's in a structured environment is very, very important. Well, Sean, so, the, you know, these apps and these programs, they, they, they're very good for what they do. They help you build vocabulary. You're, you're going to learn some um, some sentences. But it's not the same as having a native speaker sitting there with you, explaining and helping you work through these things. Now, we, for the people that have come down that have already done Rosetta Stone or whatever, I mean, they have a, a better vocabulary. So I encourage people to use them. But it is not, it's not a, it's, it's, it's not, it's still not being in language school, you know, but, but all of these things are helps. And, and I do want to say, I mean, we'd love to, anybody that wants to learn Spanish, we'd love to have you come down and check out our school. But um, the, the purpose of this, because Spanish is just one of the many languages in the world and we only teach Spanish. So for those of you that are going to Russia, that are you that are going to the Philippines, this, this, this whole class is for you as well. It doesn't, it's not about the Spanish language, it's uh, Spanish learning the language of the culture that they're going to be in. So one of the other things that happens, Sean, when people come down and we call um, language school, we also call it boot camp because it's hard. I mean, it, to learn another language, especially as you get older, it's just, it's hard. It's work. There are always those people that are not just naturally have the aptitude for language and they always blow everybody out struggling along. But um, it, for the most of us, it's just it's just hard work. Just like if you're learning calculus or you were learning, you know, whatever it was you studied in college, it's going to be the same thing. It's there's no magic pill for, for it. But what you will see is that as you begin to learn the language and, and you are beginning to have those relationships and those conversations with people, I never said a calculus, but I don't think it would blow my mind if all of a sudden I could do calculus. But I don't know how many times, especially back when I was really learning Spanish, I'm pretty fluent now, but um, where I would say, wow, I can't believe I just had a conversation in another language with a person. And it was actually, it meant something. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it, it really does because it is through language you know, that, that we build relationships and for whatever purpose God has chosen preaching and, and, the, and the expressing of the word as his chosen way of, of expressing his love and, and the gospel. You know, mm -hmm. it says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And then goes on to say, if, you know, how blessed are the feet of those that are sent. And, you know, I mean, everybody knows that, that whole, the whole verse here. But if you look at the context, it's all about language. It's about someone speaking the word of God in a language that a person can understand. And then yeah. the Holy Spirit does the rest. And so that's why I encourage no matter where you're gonna become a missionary, if it's in a different language, learn it and learn the culture. Because that's the other thing that we do here, Sean. We don't just teach language. We help people understand culture, um, Honduran culture in this context. Um, we do have people that come to go to school with us and then they go on to Columbia or whatever. I do recommend that if you are actually going to go to say, um, you know, Ecuador, you mentioned Ecuador, and I and here's where I'm gonna like, you know, like I'm just gonna say what I what I feel in my heart it has nothing to do with our our business and our language school, but Ecuadorian um, Spanish is different than yeah. Honduran Spanish, and the Ecuadorian culture is different than Honduran culture, and so there would be absolutely no problems at all with you coming and learning. Honduran Spanish, because Spanish is Spanish, but there are things that if you studied in Ecuador that you would learn that would be different than what you would learn here studying with us. Sure. So again if, we, if, if, again, if we look at the kingdom purpose, what is the best thing for a missionary? Well, the best thing for a missionary may be to study in the country, if it's available, study in the country that they're going to be ministering in. They, they yeah. learn the, the, the idioms, the, uh, you know, the little the little phrases that that country uses and they learn learn the culture. Yeah. I mean, sure. I mean, I've heard like, you know, uh, 
you know, I had, I've had Spanish friends in our church and I've learned some of their phrases and I'd say the phrases down here and they're like, we don't say that. I mean, that's not, we don't. And then obviously we know that there's phrases here like cheque leque penqueque. I mean, you know, you go try that in Mexico, they're going to look at you like you're a knucklehead, you know, or right. I, like maca noodle. I believe that's another one. That's right. not something that they say like in Mexico. It's just something the Hondurans say. So, it no, it's, it's actually so, you know, I, my family, we pretty much grew up in Maine. My wife's from Seattle, but um, my, my kids grew up in Maine. And when, when we left Maine and went to say visit friends in Alabama, it, it's two different cultures. Yeah. You know, Alabama English is different than Maine English. And the phrases that we use up there, we'd say, wow, Mr. Man. I mean, I, I, Alabama probably doesn't have a clue what Mr. Man means, you know? Yeah. And, and so it's really the same thing when we're talking um, language in, in other countries and sometimes even different regions of, of the country, depending on the size of the country. Yeah. Yeah. Because, I mean, uh, you know, I'm not busting on Honduras, but, you know, we live around the Mayan Indians. Uh, 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 geez, I, I'm sorry. I forgot what they're called today. Uh, but anyway, uh, you know, they're, they're the descendant of the Mayan Indians and right. they have their own things that they say in the mountains, you know. And there's people in Copan Renas that don't even understand what they're saying and they live five miles away. So, and then the same thing along the Mesquitia coast. I mean, there's kids that come from the Mesquitia coast that goes to a school here uh, in, in this area. And there's things that they say that the instructors don't even know what they're talking about. So, so yeah, yeah. No, I understand what you're saying, but uh, so, so, go ahead. Well, language is obviously a very complex subject, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, if you stay, if you were to stay, our course is designed for nine months for the average person that starts at zero to go to full fluency, like advanced, um, advanced intermediate, something like that. That's where you can uh, fully speak um, Spanish in every way where you can preach in Spanish. We get a lot of people that they, they'll come for six months. That's a really popular goal that their missions agency sets. And that usually gets people about to where you can do everything in life that you would normally do without any problems. Okay. Mm -hmm. But it's very difficult when you start preaching or you want to really dig into and, and, and like if you wanted to mentor somebody or you wanted to um, counsel somebody. All right. So one of the things that we do, understanding that the guy that's going to come down and maybe just lead short term missions teams and is not a preacher, he's a carpenter. And he's going to just put together the teams and their projects. He doesn't need to maybe go to advanced levels, right? So what we do here is we actually have a map that we um, sit down with the incoming students and we say, where do you start? We give them a placement test. So we find out if they know any Spanish, maybe they took high school Spanish or college Spanish. So they know something. We'll start them out a little further up the map, uh, further down the road. And then we'll say, what are you going to be doing here? You know, and if they say, well, we're going to be primarily be working with short term missions teams, um, then, then we'll put them as where they need to be in order to fulfill their job. We'll put them at an intermediate, intermediate level. OK, mm -hmm. and, and we have a typical time frame. So it's kind of like a timeline yeah. okay, that it will take. to, And so that we help them understand approximately how long they need to be here in order to reach their goal. Now, we've had people who are pastors at heart. Maybe they're not even pastors as, as a job. And when we see those come in and um, I, I, as soon as I recognize their gifting, I immediately start working with them to stay longer because see, here's what happens, Sean. You get somebody whose real passion is for people and for, for helping and for sharing the gospel through words, right? Even if that's not their, their, their job, so, you know, title, they're going to be so frustrated when they get out into the field because they can't do what their heart wants to do, mm -hmm. right? What, what God has really called them to do. They, they're, they're frustrated. And so then what happens is they become dissatisfied with the mission field. And, and I, I really want to, I, I really want people that are listening to take me serious on this because we have a lot of experience of watching people come excited. God called me here. And two years later, they've gone home. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a lot of reasons that missionaries go home. There's, if you want to do look, there's studies, there's all kinds of data for that for why missionaries leave, leave the field. But one, when in, in, in this particular aspect, 
the failure to fully speak the language in order to do what they need to do and, and, and where they feel comfortable living in another country, all right? When, when they can't do that, that adds, like that's one of the top reasons that missionaries leave because they feel inadequate. Yeah, yeah, and I believe that. I believe that, you know, um, I, I, I resonate with what you're saying because I, I, I mean, I've been here eight years. I'm not leaving, but uh, I've, I've ran businesses since 1993. So I know how to delegate and how to hire the people to do what I do. But just think of the funds that I've wasted because I've had to hire staff to do what I really could be doing if I knew the language. So that, um, that's another that's another point. But I do want to mention one thing there. There again. And this is why we, we stress when people come in, we do this map. Because for, for you, Sean, from what I understand of what you do, you don't need the level that a pastor needs, mm -hmm. right? True. Like you said, you can go shopping, you can order, you can get a tire changed, you can get by with those things. But for some people, if they can't do that, then every single aspect of their life becomes a difficulty. Oh, be absolutely. I, I know people that are literally, they, they're not, they won't come out and say it, but they, they tense up when it's time to go down to Tigo and talk to them about their plan change because something got messed up. 100%. Oh, okay. and, and, you know, I, Tigo and, and people, people be like, what's Tigo? Tigo's a, a phone, cell phone company. Right. The uh, Aussie, I don't know if you have Aussie, but that's a home internet. So if you don't have home internet now, who are you going to call? Cause you can't speak their language. And all I have done in the past is says, you know, uh, you know, uh, I, I don't even know how I would say it right now, but I'm just saying, uh, no, no internet in Mikasa. I just say that. And then they go, well, did you check your router? Did you unplug your router? Did you know, uh, no, no internet in Mikasa. And they just keep on asking me questions. I keep on saying no internet in Mikasa, you know, right. you're like, okay, I got some dumb gringo here. <laughs> oh, so, anyway. Uh, okay. Adios. And then, you know, I just have to pray they fix it, you know? I'm right. serious. That's real deal. Otherwise, I have to call my employee and say, hey, can you call them? Here's my uh, my account number. Tell them I don't have Internet. And then she has to call me back and say, well, they're asking this. You know, it's just it's just stupid, you know. So, it, anyway. so, so that so that, that's a reality. All right. So just imagine if you're watching this from the United States and if you literally had to go into everything that you did and you had the vocabulary and the sentence structure of a two, maybe three year old, and you had to explain what you wanted. That, that's, that's kind of the context. I've had, I have one guy tell me, he says, Mike, I am so humiliated. Yes. He, said, he had a good job back in the US, a smart guy. And he says, when I came down here, he said, it was as like I was a kid again. I couldn't do anything for myself. He says, it's humiliating. And now he, you know, as he went through language school, he he, he learned the language, and that, but that was his reaction was, yeah. was to to the experience of being in a culture where you don't speak the language, right? And he says it's just I just have to depend on somebody for everything. That's basically what you, what 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 you're saying, Sean. Is sometimes you feel that way. You know how many times I've gone to the restaurant, ordered something, and I get something that I didn't order. I mean, uh, you know. I mean, uh, like, uh, I, w I went to a restaurant with my pastor in El Progreso, <laughs> Burger King, and I'm just like saying, combo uno, and, you know, and, you know, just I'm saying all these things, and I'm thinking, hey, she should understand. And then we got like a whole entire meal that we didn't even order, you know? So it's just, <laughs> so it happens. It's just, so again, what Mike's saying is so true. And again, I can, uh, I can vouch for everything he's saying. So, uh, it's just absolutely important. I know that you have a time constraint because you have an appointment here after this. So I don't want to uh, stretch out this uh, this class here, but um, just, a, just a couple other things I wanted to say myself, if you don't yeah. mind. Uh, you know, again, I, 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 I'm with Mike. I think having going to language school, if it's available to you, I really think that you should. And I think you should be able to explain to your supporters the need of doing so. And especially the fact of what Mike said out of this video. You can you can uh, definitely take what he says and use that to sell the need for you to be able to go to language school. Um, you know, also too the thing that I again these are mistakes I've made. I've surrounded myself with English speakers. 
So, you know, it's another mistake that I've made. I, I, when I first got here, I connected with English speaking pastors, English speaking people. I've staffed myself with English speaking people and I don't speak, I don't have to speak Spanish because everybody I staffed my ministry with is with uh, English. And again, for those that would say, well, I can just do what Sean does. No, you don't want to do what I do. Like Mike said, it's humiliating. It's absolutely humiliating. And, and many times I feel uh, trapped and, and in bondage because I can't just walk the streets and even have a simple conversation with somebody. I can't because all I can do is say, hola, mucho gusto, adios. You know, I, I can't have a conversation with people. I feel isolated and humiliated in many times. So please do not take what I'm saying like, oh, well, I could just do what he did. But but so to me, I would highly recommend that you spend as much time with native speakers as much as possible. And I'll even give you an example. We were building a, 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 a agricultural system here. All I had available was Spanish speaking people to work for me. And in that time frame, I learned more Spanish in those three weeks it was just absolutely amazing how much Spanish I was speaking, uh, picking up because I forced, I had to, I, I had to speak Spanish. Right. And so basically I was learning new words and I was putting phrases together and everything. And then, you know, the other thing too is reading and writing uh, the, the language will definitely help as well. Um, and then, you know, a lot of people say, you know, listen to music, uh, watch TV shows or movies in Spanish, you know, use the subtitles to kind of listen to what they're yeah. saying. And then also the final thing was this is and this 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 is true to this day. I, I don't care if I make mistakes. I used to be very, you know, just I used to feel dumb, but now I don't even care. I just I, I do my best effort. And many times over, people just appreciate that. And I can tell you this. My wife can have full blown conversations with people. And at first she could care less if she was saying the wrong things or the right things. And today she's having absolute full blown conversations with people. So, uh, so anyway, I, you know, hopefully those things help you. And yeah. be before we leave, you know, you mentioned about the homeschool. It's not about language, but but I think a, a lot of people that will be watching this will be parents, and they're going to be wanting to know a little bit about homeschooling. So this is something that uh, uh, you can share with them. Okay, so I just want to touch on just a real quick on about three, five different little points. Okay. For those of you that are going to go to language school, you will never see your advance looking forward. You're always going to say, it's not enough. I, I haven't learned enough. I still feel like that way. And I'm an advanced level. I still feel like it's not enough. The only way you, and this is to keep you encouraged. The only way you see progress is when you look backwards. Okay. When you look back and say three months ago, I couldn't do. So Sean, even you right now with, with your honesty about the little bit of Spanish, that you, that you speak, but you right now can do far more than you were able to do when you first came down here. Sure, yes. So look, look at what you were not able to do when you first came, mm -hmm. right? So I know you feel like you don't speak a whole lot of Spanish, but I think you speak a lot more Spanish than you think you do, mm -hmm. all right? So be encouraged. It, it is a lifetime experience. You're constantly learning and expanding your vocabulary and whatever. But remember, the only way you see progress is when you look backwards and say, you know what? I'm doing today what I couldn't do six months ago, okay? The other thing I want to point out is you mentioned English speakers. It is absolutely critical when you're in language school, once, once you reach a, you know, once you have something to work with, some vocabulary and some sentence structure and some verbs, is, is practice. Practice, practice, practice. You said you, you learn, you start speaking more in three weeks than you had in a long time because you were forced to. That is absolutely critical. But remember this. Your heart language will always be your first language, whether that's English or um, Canadian. Not just joke there. Um, <laughs> I've got some great friends that are Canada from Canada. I tease them all the time. But, um, but what, whatever your primary language is, that's always going to be your heart language. And you've got to give yourself time from time to time to just get around people that speak your heart language where you can just relax. OK, um, but the practice is absolutely perfect. Husbands and wives. You both need to go to language school. You guys are both going to learn at different rates. Forget the competition. We've we've seen a lot of competition between husbands and wives, you know. And I'm just going to tell you right now: do not go down that road. Okay. <laughs> One of you is going to. This is the way I, I think God designs it. Play. One of you is going to speak better than the other, and one of you is going to understand better than the other. 
And Makes together, sense. together, you're going to make a team. Okay, so re remember that. All right, children, and I'm going to come around to this homeschool thing. You most likely, when you go to language school, um, I'm not sure what you're. You're probably going to be homeschooling your kids because in, unless uh, the language school or the town or something has a place for you to enroll your kids, you need to enroll your kids in the language school. Okay. And the reason I say that is number one, kids learn at a far greater rate and faster than adults ever will. But when you're a kid, your mind absorbs things and you learn things differently than when your, your mind becomes about 10, 11, 12, your mind starts changing. You have to study as you get older. With children, they just absorb it. Give your kids that opportunity to actually learn a language where they don't have to work at it. And here's the other thing. They're part of your team. I know my boys, when they came down with me, they said, Dad, we're just along for the ride because <laughs> we have to go with you because we're only 13 and 14. But you know what? I wanted my kids to feel like they're a part of the team. And so even if they only enroll in the language school for an hour or two a week, it makes them feel like they're part of the, the, the whole um, challenge and the whole struggle that language school can be. And well, it's, it's going to give them a super huge benefit. They're going to get out on, with a little bit of language. They're going to feel confident enough to get out on the soccer field and play with um, native kids. And from there, they're just going to, you're going to be amazed at how fast they learn. Mm -hmm. um, one more thing. Language is cultural. I cannot tell you how many missionaries, and, and that's because that's, our, that's our, 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 our niche market, that I have seen offend people because they don't intend to but they don't understand culturally how to phrase something. We Americans are very direct. We walk into a room, we bypass saying hello to everybody. We go like, Sean, I go straight to you. And I say, Sean, I need this. You give me what I want and I leave, all right? In, in the Latin culture, that's very, very rude. You need to stop, you need to greet anybody. But here's the thing, if I came up to Sean and he was under and I said, Sean, I need this. Unless he really has worked a lot with Americans and understands how direct we are, that would be offensive because I was demanding of you. Now, I didn't mean it that way. And you, as an American, you wouldn't have felt that. Yeah. But as a Honduran, you would feel that. Okay. So what you do with language is you use the conditional. Now, that just means the conditional is just another conjugation of, of the verb form. And instead of saying, yo necesito, I need this, you would say something like, um, podría ayudarme con esta. All right. And that would mean like, could you help me with this? And you, it's just a, uh, it's culturally, it's a polite way to say that. Right. And then w one last point on that. The, in, in, in English, we don't use the reflexive verb form. The reflexive verb is it, it reflects back onto the object. Now, I did not understand this in Honduran culture and in the Spanish language. It is very difficult for somebody in the Latin culture to take responsibility for something because the language doesn't permit it. So for instance, if you broke a window, you wouldn't say, I broke the window. You would wow. say, the window broke itself. That is the way, grammatically speaking, that you would say that, hmm. okay? Now, I didn't understand how freeing this was. Until one day I was sitting with all of our teachers around the big table, we're having a staff meeting. And I, as you can see, I talked with my arms, right in my hands. And I did that and I knocked my coffee cup over and the coffee spilled over, headed for everybody's paperwork, everybody's scrambling. And I just sat back and I said, well, it tipped itself over in Spanish. Yeah. Right? Se cayó la casa. All right. It, those, those are the kinds of things that until you really dig into to language, you don't understand how much language affects culture. And so as a, sometimes as, as an American, we say, no, you tip that over. They don't understand it. They say, no, the language says it tipped itself over. That's All right? wild. I did not know that. Yes, it, it is a fascinating, fascinating study. I have so many other examples of words that mean something to us that don't mean the same thing. Um, the context, but we're, we're out of time for that. But it is, it, it is so worth delving into the language and the language culture of, of your, of your host country. And then I, and I want to just say one other thing. You know, no matter how much you learn or how little you learn, if you learn at least something and you're making that effort, Sean, just as you are, 
It means so much to people when you can speak some language, some greetings, something in their language, right? It's just, it's just one of those things. It's just in, in the Latin cultures, especially they, they appreciate it. So whatever time that you take to learn, it is never going to be um, time wasted. I can guarantee that. Sean, real quick, just going back to, um, to homeschooling. I just want to tell people that um, my, my boys were homeschooled right from the beginning, um, and we continued when we were down here. And here at the, the Institute, we have spent about the last year developing a homeschool program. And this is the, it's an online program. Um, we do a lot of online classes teaching you know people all around the world or whatever. But this one is designed specifically home for, for homeschoolers. And I, I want to say this because a lot of missionaries homeschool their kids. And um, a lot of uh, Christians, they, have, they homeschool their kids. And one of the things that we noticed at, is, is that our kids didn't receive a lot of the social interaction that you would get if you went to a school, whether it's public or private school. And so we started our kids um, back when we were in Maine in a co-op as they would go and they would have a class together, whether it was bicycle repair or whatever. The kids loved it because it was interaction. So we, we saw a market for, um, for homeschoolers and we've developed a program that is an interact. Most of our classes are one-on-one, -on -one, but this is an interactive group class and you're either studying with your brothers and sisters, but what we'd really like to see is that you study with your friends. So you're all kind of the same age group. And most states require that you have a second language to graduate. So we want, our goal is to have kids learn a language, have fun, have fun with their friends. And then when they reach a certain age, like 16, if they've reached a certain level, we want to invite them to come to study with us for three weeks as a, and well, it would be like a group and they would come down here, they would study in person. And then we will have, um, in the afternoons, we'll have time to go out and practice their class, uh, what they're studying and to actually get out, do a little missions work and, and actually get to see the culture. So, um, Sean is going to put up our, the link to our website. We're really excited about this program. We are, um, we're, we're passionate about language, but we, we want, we understand that language is, is much more than just speaking words. It's really about the interaction between humans. And again, like I said before, it's God's uh, method of expressing his love to us. Um, so we, that's one of the things that we, we are passionate about and uh, we invite you to check us out. On Amen. The, on Amen. Well, and like Mike said, I'm going to put those links in the description here. So uh, make sure you check them out, whether it's for language or homeschooling. Um, and then Mike did a, a, a kind of a, not not a class, but uh, we talked to him about business as well. So if you're a gentleman or, you know, even a not a gentleman, just if you're somebody, a missionary that wants to maybe even look at uh, doing a business in the foreign field, Mike uh, really has a heart for that. And he wants to encourage people to contact him as well about that. So, uh, you know, Mike just has a heart for missionaries, um, but he's a very entrepreneurial man. And, uh, you know, he's got quite a few businesses in Honduras and uh, you connect with actual governmental officials and everything. I mean, you you roll with uh, the big boys in this country. So anyway, we uh, do. We, we get right down in the villages, too. Um, that's one of the things that I love down here. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, thank you so much, Mike, for just uh, taking the time to share from your heart about uh, learning the language down here. Uh, and, uh, you know, helping those that are looking at becoming a full-time missionary. Thanks again. It's good to see you, Mike. John, thanks for what you're doing. Appreciate you. Okay. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.